Andy is the director of high performance at Red Bull, and his research is centered on elite performance for both personal and organizational strategies. He's worked with some of the world's leading athletes, as well as corporate brands, including Jaguar and Land Rover. Previously, Andy led the high performance division uh, for the US Olympic ski team. Please join me in welcoming Andy Walsh. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Well, firstly, I'd just like to thank everyone for this opportunity. Um, a big part of my business is spending time with people who are really good at what they do and uh, learning from them. So uh, I'm really uh, excited to spend a bit of time with you guys the next day or so to pick up a little bit and see if any of what I talk about resonated with you. Um, as a little bit of background, uh, my, my role within the organisation is to support the talent. The talent either being an athletic program or a cultural program, which is musicians, artists, etc. Typically, the, the simplest way to explain it is they come in, they want to do something pretty extraordinary, and then my job is to help set up the systems, processes, training to help them achieve that goal. So it's a little hard to explain, so what I'd just like to kick it off with is a little video to sort of covers the type of people we're working with, the type of activities we're involved in. If you're going to stay around and be safe for your whole life, then you never really lived and you're already dead. It's a pretty indescribable feeling. This is Big Snoop Dogg, and this is Sound Clash, so stay tuned. Red Bull, they've been trying to push boundaries musically. The MC in me wants to see, like, who's going to be the sickest individual. There's never a circumstance where there's no consequence. So needless to say, it's a lot of fun. Um, <coughs> Probably the easiest way to think about it, there's, there's around 600 athletes in the program, 172 different disciplines. They're all usually best in the world or hoping to be best in the world. And then right now there's about 1,200 to 1,500 musicians and artists associated with our cultural program. So what, for that, what that means for me is it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to spend time with these individuals and learn how they do what they do, understand what they need to go through to achieve these amazing things, and then rework it so that we can share it with everybody else, if that makes sense. So um, I want to blow through the first few slides. They're more process-based, a little bit of background, and then get into some of the meat of the, of the conversation. But um, you know, I, I think a very interesting point of difference about our program and what most elite performance programs do is that they tend to focus on, or within discipline is what we say. Um, an example even today, sort of entrepreneurs or VC people or business people spending time with other business people trying to learn what they do. 
understand how they've achieved success and learn from them and obviously try and avoid the mistakes they made. And most sports programs around the world are focused like that. If you want to be a better golfer, you know, you go out and see what Tiger did. Try and replicate how he played, what he did, how much he's coached, what he eats, how much he sleeps, if he sleeps anymore, I don't know. But really, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting way and it's a very effective model, it's very efficient and it really does produce great results. We take a very different approach. We try to isolate out within a given mastery or craft that we're looking at. We try and pick, say, the designated skill sets or critical success factors that pertain to that particular craft and then we look multidisciplinary across sports or across individuals to see how to make that work. So imagine if you want to be a world-class athlete, it's very easy for us to then look out and say, okay, some of the characteristics that require perfection at the top of the game. Presence, uh, status, uh, presence and calmness of mind might be one. So to understand that principle, we'll look at maybe the religious the Eastern philosophies. The ability to perform under pressure or perform as part of a team. Athletes are good at it, per se, but military operators and Tier 1 Special Forces are excellent at that. When the consequences of failure or death, you learn how to perform under pressure. So we draw and we create these ideas or these models, if you like, of world-class performance, and that's how we then frame up our training and strategy within that. Does that make sense? So if we look at a model of high performance as, as a conceptual framework, we, we go around the characteristics of what it takes someone to succeed and we break it out based on best-in-class practices and then we use those practices to redefine and build our model. So you can see the conceptual framework on the wall there. For a sport, for example, there's a physical component, there's a psychological component, there's a technology piece to sport, most sport nowadays, there's a spiritual component, there's a life skills component. So what we try and do is decide, okay, if we're going to be really good at a particular craft or a particular sport, we'll go to the masters in that particular craft and we'll frame up and benchmark against them. So what does that do? Well, it allows us to obviously allocate resources and dive into areas that are important. So if you're looking to become a world-class marathon runner, for example, we're going to dig in deep. We're going to get down to the cellular and, and, and macrobiology level and sort of try and influence your performance there. If you're trying to run a two-hour marathon, you know, you've got to be paying attention to that level. If we're looking at one of our bigger programs with respect to technology, the influence and how we allocate resources there, we base our model based on that allocation. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. Obviously, the car got to go, no matter how fit the driver is. If the car goes, you can make the driver pretty fit. But if the car don't go, it's not going to work for you. So it's a system. It's very simple, very, very fundamental, and nothing new to most of you people in the room. But what it does do is it allows us to set up a framework, a process by which we can then benchmark and then improve the talent we have. And this talent is about making people best in the world. It's not about, you know, it's about moving from third on the podium to one on the podium. It's not about being pretty good. It's about being really bloody good at what you do. And we need to have this level of integrity and rigour in the system so we can look to see where we're falling short and where we're not actually achieving the targets we've set for ourselves. So the first thing is we build this model. And the funny thing about it is if you pull the brain of the Dalai Lama with the performance under pressure characteristics of a SEAL Team 6 guy, build that up with the entrepreneurial risk sort of taking expertise of, say, a Steve Jobs or someone like that, and you build this model out for a particular sport, you've created a superhuman of kinds. And the beauty of that superhuman in that particular sport is that they are then, the people you're working with, even though they may be best in the world, they're still not as good as this hypothetical model you've built. So what does that do? It gives them something to aim for. They hate being second. Yeah, they really do. These kinds of people don't want to be second. And what it also allows you to do is it allows you to keep that carrot out in front of them because you're always improving that model. So you build this model based on world-class performance. You benchmark these people against it. And then you do something. You try something, you do something. You train them a little harder, you put them through some sort of experience, and then you measure it and you just spin around that circle. The best part about it is you get to sit down with these individuals and truly try to understand who they are. What are their dreams? What are their motivations? What are their fears? And through that process, you can really then start to build these programs out that really support them in what they're trying to do. And they achieve amazing things. So it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But if this was a world-class entrepreneur, per se, we've created this amazing hypothetical model based on all the characteristics we thought an entrepreneur needed to be best in the world. We would then benchmark you against it, and that's as simple as that. 
We know what we can work on, we know where you're strong, we know where you're weak, and we start to play in that space. So, obviously this is hypothetical, and I've simplified it a little for the conversation, but the principle is exactly the same. So let's dig into it a little bit. Then we'll talk about the process. Let's talk about actually what we do, which is a, little, a lot more fun. Um, so I picked one skill because that has, you know, typically people want to get better at something. People are always trying to either get better at their golf game, their tennis game, maybe get better at business, better in the family. And so over all the years and looking at all these amazing people, we figured out there's fundamentally very simple things you can do to improve someone in a particular craft. And if you want the five top ones for us, that's what they are. If they're motivated or if you need to motivate them, that's fundamental. Most of the people we work with are obviously highly motivated, so that's not an issue. You've got to give them a chance to practice, repetition, progression. Now, once they've hit that next level that you're aiming for, you've got to keep moving the bar, keep moving the bar. You know, you're only as good as your last game, is the old saying, and that's exactly how it works in sport and, and, and working with elite talent. Feedback and some of the technology related to feedback is enhancing this area substantially, but feedback, letting them know when they screw up and letting them know when they do well, fundamental stuff. And the big one is failure. Failure is okay. In fact, if you're not failing in our business, and then you're not obviously pushing your limits, and then you're not actually trying to push the boundaries of what you're doing, then we know you're not at the level we need to have you. And that little simple slide, there's a little reminder for us of the last Stratus project on the second man flight, um, when we actually dug in the capsule into the ground pretty hard after Felix exited, you know, and, it, and it's staggering how those failures, even in an organisation like us, rattle everybody and push everybody down and people start second guessing and everything. You've got to keep on the top of the mind and say, this is, this is important, this is us learning, this is us pushing the envelope. It's an important part of what we're doing and you've got to keep that in perspective. So what does it look like? Let's give you a practical example. And I drew out all my Aussie athletes because it's an Aussie crowd. So this is Matter, Robbie Madison, if you don't know him. Guy from uh, down south of Sydney, amazing motocross driver. And this is a project we worked on for about six months, 12 months actually, after the initial conception. And this is how we sort of, you probably saw the outcome of this event he did in Las Vegas, New Year's Eve, in front of a big crowd, 40, 50,000 people and broadcast nationally. That's his wife, by the way, if you haven't one, guessed. The sweet spot we talked about, he made it look so easy. You see that piece of white tape? That's the line he has to ride off, because you can't see when you ride off where you're going. you just got to ride off blind. Now comes what has been said to be the hardest part. As if ten stories skyrocketing into the air isn't enough. The crew all back down. Here it comes. So right now he's riding around, he's actually trying to find third gear. Because if he's in third gear, the bike won't lock up and crash when he hits off the jump. But Robbie's so confident as he goes to the edge of that 100 foot drop. He's checking the bike is in the right gear, you can see him there, pushing up and down on the shifter pedal. Here we go. <laughs> he did it! He made it. So how do you teach someone to do something like that? <laughs> You've got to be motivated, of course. You've got to be motivated. You need a chance to practice. You need feedback. You need to be able to fail. Obviously not on the evening. That would be bad for the press. But on everything beforehand is set up so you can practice to the point of failure. And so that's how we did it. And this is what it looks like. Exact copy of the dark. And off he goes. And the wonderful thing is, with the progression and system that we described, anyone in this room could do it if they had it, wanted to have a go. It might take a little longer than a year, but you could get there. Did you notice that, that table, that platform he's on? The progression was we just raise it 10 feet at a time, 10 feet at a time, 10 feet at a time. There's big safety barriers and things in there, so if he comes off, he's not going to get hurt. But it's very simple, and it can do those simple systems repeated over and over again and applied consistently can get people to do amazing things. I 
Um, I picked this one as well. Obviously, I can't go through all of them today. I don't have time and I don't want to bore you. Nutrition's a staggering one for us and, and for this crowd especially, for our lens and what we're seeing right now, the, the innovation and the progression in the world of nutrition is absolutely uh, breathtaking and it's... And I'm, I'm really excited as one uh, to sort of watch this progression because it means that some of the things we've been able to do with these world-class athletes and world-class military groups and sort of elite business people, if you like, and it's, it was, which were very much restricted because of either access or cost, will now be available to everyone in the next five to ten years. And the profound impact they can make on the individual from both a health and gen general well-being perspective is staggering. Where we are is actually we're trying to tweak it to enhance cognitive capacities, improve brain function, improve physical performance, improve blah, 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 blah. And once you start to get your hands on some of that stuff, I tell you, you guys are going to be excited. Um, to give you a sense, um, this slide just sort of reflects. This is a slide that just popped out of some of the DARPA research recently, and it's a field obviously everyone's looking in. Uh, nothing new about that from both a damage control and mitigation of uh, damage to the human system right up to performance optimization. A lot more work being done on the clinical preventative side, but you flip that switch and it's about making people a lot better than they currently are or giving them the opportunity for that. Um, for us, and you won't be able to read this slide, but trust me, um, we do a lot, a lot of blood work on our athletes and we take these tests which 10 years ago, 15 years ago were $100,000 a person. Now they're about 1200 bucks a person. And some of the things I've seen recently is you'll be able to put the tablet on the end of your, end of your tongue, connect it to your iPhone and you'll get the same sort of reports in the next five, 10 years. These, these results, this information makes a staggering difference to the, our ability to help these people improve. The top one is neurotransmitters, so that's a se selection of um, chemical markers that are used to sort of optimise brain function cognitive ability, executive function, creativity, if you like. The middle one is a, a, a stress marker, cortisol stress marker that we look at in terms of assessing overtraining and the ability for someone to tolerate the, the, the loads that we're putting them under. And the bottom one's an oxidative DNA marker damage. So again, very sophisticated, many years ago, or several years ago, out of the reach of everyone, but very quickly coming to the forefront and gonna make a significant impact on the health and well-being of individuals. But if that all means crap to you, then this is the one most people remember. And very simply, a young child with a cognitive learning disorder who was basically found to be um, deficient in several sort of critical amiga acids based on the type of testing we're doing, supplement them over a three month period and that's a difference in their handwriting skills. So we obviously wanna take it from how to make you someone who's not just fixing what's wrong, but taking someone who's already really good at this and then optimising their nutrition to take them above and beyond current function. Obviously, I thought um, for people like yourselves and in people who are sort of managing risk and trying to explore risk in the marketplace, that this might be an interesting topic for you. The psychology of performance is a big, big area. Um, it's probably still the most fertile ground for innovation and understanding for the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years. We've learned a lot, lot more about the you know, sort of below the neck business, heart, lungs, body, function. The brain has been out of reach in many ways, but the new technologies that we're playing with are allowing us um, sort of precedent and insight into this sort of working function of the athlete, if you like, or the people we're working with. We break it down, as I said, there's the, the psychology is broken down from a mind, brain, and nutrition perspective. Because if the nutritional levels and the functional levels of the compounds in your brain required for performance aren't there, we can't, all the other factors that we add on to all the other training we do aren't optimised. So we need to optimise that piece of the program. The mind is more the behavioural stuff, the traditional psychology piece that people think about, and the, the brain is the mechanical wiring. So to give you a snapshot of what that looks like, is this is a new system we're prototyping. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, one of the sort of listening to the people this morning, I, was, I sort of caught up in the idea that this, we work mostly with startups because we're trying to break sort of uh, into areas that are sort of untouched in terms of human optimization. So typically it's the startups or new companies who are developing the technology that allows us to go in and look at what we're doing with individuals. Uh, so it's interesting that I, I sort of, that was sort of refreshed to me this morning listening to your, your panel before me. This little system is uh, basically replaces a room full of equipment. It's connected to the brain. It measures the brain activity. Hoo ha ha! No big deal. It's been done for a long time. It's never been portable. Um, but what we're able to do is we're able to start to now collect this data and use this data to start to segregate the panels and people we're working with. 
So this is typically the type of thing we're starting to play with. Again, these are dr dramatic representations. It doesn't actually look like this. But you think what I said earlier, we have this extraordinary talent pool who we're collecting this amazing information on. And the technology in its own way is allowing us an insight into that activity. Right now, it's still static. It's still in the lab. But in the next generation, we're asking them to put these systems on our people when they're doing extraordinary things, like jumping off a few hundred foot cliff with a chute or surfing into or paddling into a, uh, a massive wave at Jaws or performing in front of an amazing crowd at, at um, you know, a big stadium or a big act. And when we start to get that information about how these people operate in critical moments, it's going to be a profound imp improvement on what we are able to do because the reverse function of these systems and what we're starting to see now is that you can not only measure what's going on in these people's brains as they're performing and doing amazing things, but then you can capture that image plug it back in through a reverse feedback system and actually train the brain up through plasticity sort of mechanisms and enhance people's function towards the brains of these operators. And um, I just presented this to my bosses at work, so I obviously <laughs> had to have a bit of a dig at them, you know. <laughs> but if all that sort of sounds a little bit gobbledygook, uh, you know, the reality is if you listen and looked at any of the people doing these extraordinary things, you can pick up the basic premise of what I'm talking about. So this next video I'm going to show is Ian Walsh, one of our best big wave surfers, and he's surfing at a wave in Tahiti that is uh, extraordinarily dangerous. If you're not familiar with the surf industry, this wave sucks out of the middle of the ocean, opens up on a very, very shallow reef. It's only, the water's only about that deep where he's surfing. It's a very, very dangerous uh, wave. And uh, what I challenge you to do, as I said, if you listen carefully, if you, if you pay attention to the way Ian talks about his experience, you'll actually pick up the references what a world-class performer speaks to and how they activate under these sorts of situations. My feeling when I got to the channel was just kind of antsy. Yeah, you're waiting to see what the day will hold. Ian Walsh didn't catch that many waves, but the ones he caught were the bombs. My morning started, like I said, we got out there and instead of watching it, we figured we'd just tow into a couple to warm up. And my first wave, I was a little bit too deep and I tried to, to do these three pumps as I pulled into the barrel and on the third one when I was in the barrel, I purled from the wave sucking up so much and I just did a cartwheel through the barrel, head over heels, got whipped and then I got held under for a pretty long time and right when I popped up, I saw Jamie Sterling pulling into this huge barrel that was just unloading like 10 feet in front of me and I got blown into the lagoon. And I couldn't really swim, I had two life jackets on, and I got drug over the reef into the lagoon, and then I was pretty much warm and ready. <laughs> it was really crowded, <laughs> so we were just kind of trying to be patient and only go on good waves, not really waste our time on the smaller ones that everyone was trying to battle for. You never know how big it could really be out there. Could, you don't know if you, the swell didn't peak, or it peaked overnight, or if it's gonna peak at noon, so I'm just kind of anxious, that's the feeling. On a big day, we don't really care to go for a million waves. We're not here for that. We want to try to get the wave of the day. The next wave was pretty much the best wave of my life. I thought it was a decent sized wave. I didn't think it was going to be like a gigantic wave or anything. The water was pulling so hard off the reef, and you're going against the grain. So it just feels like it's yanking you up the face, and you just got to hold your line. So I just leaned as hard as I could into my heels. And I could, as it started a barrel when I was going into it, I remember it getting all dark. It felt like I was in the shadow of it. It felt pretty tall, but I didn't, couldn't really tell how tall it was. And I remember right when I made the turn in the barrel, and it just felt like I could fit like a school bus next to me. And then I saw from there the shock wave like shot up and was like hitting the back of my foot. That's, I thought the wave was just gonna pass me by and eat me, and the foam ball was just gonna like annihilate me. You could die, but. That's kind of, you want to try to keep that in the back of your mind, not really in the front. <laughs> you're just stoked you made it, and you're that close to falling, and those are always the best waves of your life when you think you're not going to make it. You're like, oh, I'm too deep, I'm too deep, I'm too deep, and then you take a different line, and the foam ball hits you and shoves you out. And that, that surprise is what makes it the best wave of your life. I was happy. <laughs> Ten years ago, people would have saw a photo of that wave and thought, no way, that's even rideable. So what do you think of the cues to that guy and what he's able to do? The, he's, a, he's performing, obviously, under highly 
stressful situation, for want of a better term. Um, well, what are the cues, if you listen to him, that you picked up on that sort of let you know, let, help you understand why he's able to do what he does? Control. control? Able to control his and not Yeah, yeah. Keep himself together. What's a, how do you pick that up? How, what's the cue to that, that he's able to do that within that, that dialogue of the, of the pattern? That's one of the big giveaways. If you listen to any world-class uh, performer and ask them to recount maybe a past act that they did that's highly successful, they'll give you detail. You know, I was back there, my foot was in the wrong position, I moved it a little, I balanced off, I could feel the water behind me. Most people are going like, oh shit, I don't want to die here, you know? That's going to be... <laughs> that's going to be the majority of responses if I drag you out there and drop you in that situation, you know? What's another cue? Yeah, yeah, I, I push the thought, I don't want to die, I want to push that to the back of my mind, that's a helpful tip. Yeah, in, ref in reflection he was, he was. One of the biggest cues though is what happened at the beginning. He got beat down, failed in front of all his peers, in front of the world watching, this is all broadcast remember, and what, did he have, what was his response to that? I'm ready to go now. Almost died a minute ago, but now I'm ready to go. And that's one of the characteristics. There's a lot more there, but you kind of get the idea. If you pay attention to what they're saying and you listen a little bit more carefully to these people, it's all out there. You just got to look, get past the kind of wow factor a little bit and start to listen to this, and it's all there for the taking. So there is a bit of science too. One of the first things we try and do with these guys is actually explain to them what's going on. So who's seen this before, this curve? performance arousal, if you had any major, oh, sorry, minor psychology training in your background, you would have seen this in 101. It's basically the flight or flight curve, if you like, you know. You've heard that system, you know, under a certain level of stress, the body responds either to the flight or flight mode as it gets, as it gets excessive. Well, the simple explanation is that for any given performance, for any given person, it's highly individualised, a certain level of excitement, arousal, pressure, if you like, whatever you want to call it, will improve your performance, don't you agree? The boss says, get that done, now. What do you do? He's, he's bumped the arousal up, you get it done. No matter who you are and what you do, at a certain point, if we push you past the middle of the curve, what starts to happen? Freaking out. Freaking out. Shakes, nervousness, heart of breath, you're not focusing on what you need to do. And no, it doesn't matter who you are, we could push anybody past that curve. So the goal for us is just to explain this first to the athletes so they're aware of what's going on, but for us to shift that curve up and to the right. But we want to make sure we push beyond the middle point, and why is that? So we know where it is. Most people play on the left side of that curve. It's comfortable. There's no risk, real risk involved. I'm risking, but they're not, you know. And people need to be pushed beyond, in our business, beyond that point, so we know what we've got. So we know where the failing point is. Obviously, for the performance on the day, we want to bring it back a notch, but training and practice and, and, and pressure and adding that value off to the right is how you shift that curve up and to the right. What if you find yourself over to the right? How do you bring it back? What's a simple tool to, if you find yourself way to the right of that curve, if you hate public speaking or you want to ask that guy over at the bar out for a date, your heart's thumping, <laughs> the heart rate's raising, what's the trick? Breathe slowly. Breathe slowly. The system is hardwired into your body. If you control the breathing, you will settle all the other emotions down. And hence, when you see anybody about to do anything significant, The more control and practice you have over your breathing, the quicker you can bring it back down. So it's a very simple tip. The other thing we do is we spend a lot of time, and I think, again, maybe something of relevance to this crowd, is understanding risk. For us, obviously, there's high consequence to a lot of what we do, especially in the sporting field, but even for the individuals who are just trying to do a better job with their careers with respect to, say, the entertainment business, a big mistake at the wrong time can really be damaging to that career. But if you're not out there risking it, you're not pushing the limits, then you're not going to stand out amongst that crowd. So we try and develop an understanding or a mastery of risk, and we do that again through understanding. So if you look at that yellow curve, perceived risk is high, actual risk is really low. What's a good example of that? Parachuting. Parachuting? Yeah? 
If you look at the statistics, driving a car, actually the risk is probably pretty high depending on where you live, you know. <laughs> I live in LA, so I won't be pushed that one over to the right a little. Airplane. Airplane, stand up. Public speaking is one of the classics. Most number one fear in Americans is public speaking. What's going to happen if I get up here and make a mistake? Are you guys going to throw things at me? <laughs> no. It's all perception. If you look at the other side of the curve, what's going on there? The actual risk is extraordinarily high, but the perception is low. I deal with a lot of this. <laughs> oh, I'm good to go. I like, no, you're not. <laughs> this is dangerous. This is where people get killed. So you've got to balance it. You've got to balance both sides. What we want to achieve is an understanding for the very best performers. They're doing extraordinarily amazing things with high risk to either career or life or both. We want to be performing up on the blue corner where the risk, the, the risk and hence the reward is extraordinarily high, but our understanding is matched so we can mitigate that risk. So we start off with small things and we edge it out, out, out and out. So public speaking is actually a good tool to use to teach a world-class performer if that's something they're not comfortable with, how to manage themselves, manage their in internal processes, manage their environment. It can be anything. Does that make sense? Kind of simple concepts, but once you understand them and start to learn within them, you start to really develop an ability to manage it at a high level, and that's when you start to look for these exceptional performances. Um, I thought this would be an interesting one, again, because you guys are in the business of new product, innovation, creativity, design, or a lot of you are. And for us, creativity really stood out in the last few years as an opportunity, in, especially in the less obvious fields. Again, back to sport. But when you think about it, the Jordans, the Woods, the Williams of the world, when they play at the level they play at, when they perform at that level, they redefine the entire culture underneath that particular sport from our understanding of what's possible. Jordan's probably the easiest example. When he came out and played the way he played, he actually reinvented the game of base basketball, didn't he? He showed us a new way of what, what's possible and hence the game changed forever. So in, in essence, he was being highly creative. But when I looked at it, and again, we're all about looking for the white space where other people aren't playing to give our crew a competitive advantage. So it's like, holy hell, no one's training creativity down at the NRL. Maybe, you know? But the reality is there's such a powerful opportunity if we can harness it. So typically in our way, back to the original model, who's the best at the world in a creative environment with a physical component? We looked around, we're like, you know, Cirque du Soleil are pretty handy. We partnered up with them based on some, uh, uh, yeah, some initial conversations. So we just grabbed four, four of our world's best girls and we stuck them with Cirque du Soleil for a week. And this is what it looks like. Ready? Deep breath. And laugh. <laughs> Deep breath. And scene. Rebel is taking a few world-class athletes to train with Cirque du Soleil and to open up a window into their understanding of creativity, imagination and ultimately themselves. I'm Chris Amore. I'm Kai Tursky. I am Dallas Friday. I'm Heather McPhee. I'm Megan Ethel. I'm Maya Gabeira. I'm a professional surfer and an artist. The group, quick, 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 group, 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 group. The athlete to artist idea, when they first spoke about it, just resonated with us. That's it, that's good, it's exactly that. A little bit slower. When you think about those two things, being creative, being using your imagination and putting it to play in a really athletic way, there's no one who does it any better than the Cirque crew. Exaggerate, exaggerate. My name is Ben Podvain. I work for Cirque du Soleil, and we're working with the Red Bull High Performance team. What we're trying to do is throw them a curveball and just get them outside of their comfort zone. They're all individual, high, high-end world champions, and you give them tools that, that might enhance their performance. Yes! <laughs> get them to express their emotions. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an exercise that you take 
an emotion from zero to 10, okay? And you can play with fear or, or uh, happiness. And I think they're not gonna feel too comfortable doing that. Who are you? Like, who, who are you really? Well, my vision for today is animal. If somebody comes directly from sport, when they come into the Cirque family, they become an artist. And explore something different and channel a totally different energy, you know, when you're surfing. When they're really pushing the top of the game, that's for us uh, one of those opportunities for them to get better. I want to win an Olympic gold. Crazy! <laughs> Someone else. The who are you might start it with a straight jump. You ask them the same thing a year down the road after they've done classes. It's going to become way more than a straight jump. Could I almost act my way into the zone for my sport? Like, could I practice this and almost get myself to that emotion more consistently? That would be a really interesting thing to play with. The best in the world are highly creative. They're trying to figure out how to do things a little differently. They're trying to create new tricks. Rebel's in a unique position with the program. First and foremost, they're the only brand who really has a high performance strategy in place. And taking from what the Cirque performers do and the coaches are teaching them and giving that back to our athletes is just a, you know, it's a no brainer. And it gives them, hopefully, that little edge to help them compete and perform you know, on the day. Creativity and imagination, that's why we're here. Are these lashes wild? I feel like I should bring them to the hill and just scare all my competitors. <laughs> a wonderful experience for the girls, as you can see, and, uh, and transformational in many ways for them. Uh, and, and did you pick up the language and you heard the change maybe, you, you know, you can see that they're starting to explore a different side of themselves. And that was a simple one. We didn't know what we are doing, so we didn't know what they were doing, we just threw them together. And that's the sort of thing that we typically start with. We don't wait to figure it out, we don't wait for the science to support it, we just start going. But really for us then, that led to, hey, this is a real opportunity. Those, several of those girls went on to some really significant improvements in their uh, sporting performance. So we said, we need to learn a little bit more about that. So we started, again, using our network to work on this hacking creativity idea, where we, uh, we realised that in order for us to now train it and really emphasise this modality within our, uh, within our, our sort of performance fr uh, frameworks, we needed to understand it at a whole other level. So what we did was we set about and said, OK, there's obviously a lot of already really bright people doing amazing things in this space out there. So we actually went again to another young startup here in San Francisco, the Quid Group, um, who use a, have a basically web crawler that goes out and they, they use it to sort of help understand market impact and strategy decisions with really large companies. And we said, well, you know, through a connection we had, so well, can you turn this around? Can you have this engine go out and look for all the information on creativity and pull it back in? They go, yeah, I think we can. And so what you see spinning around at the right is the synopsis of 15,000 articles and research papers and p information, if you like, that was sourced over that year period on creativity, and they've brought it into one spot. And actually, it's the first time it's ever been done. So straight away, we sort of suddenly got this awareness of what the landscape looked like from the research that had been done in the past. We said, okay, that's great, but let's talk to the masters, the people who are really doing the job. So then we turned it around, you see the right, top right, you see the kind of the inspiration. We started to find these individuals who'd been filming and recording these creative masters and asking them questions on how they innovated and how they designed and how they created over their careers. And suddenly we had this another amazing input to our model, if you like. And the best part about it is the Quid Engine can actually go into the transcripts and pull the themes and subcontexts out of those interviews. So then the third part, which is TBD, is we're going to turn this around and then have the world participate through all our connections, our athletes, our artists, and the rest of the marketing engine, allow people to offer up their input into what they think creativity is. The whole time the engine's spinning and pulling out the excerpts of it. And then that thing will sit there and live there for us to use as a training tool, but hopefully uh, for the public to access, because it'll be, it'll be live and open if all goes to plan. So that gives you a sense of more the scientific back end to some of the practical stuff we do. Um, I'm getting towards the end here, but uh, I, I found this one fascinating because, again, it was another white space for us. There's a lot of, you hear a lot of uh, world-class performers talk about looking inside themselves to try and find that extra bit to go above and beyond. And uh, we obviously work with some amazing individuals and someone like Ian, who you said surfing before, if we want to improve him in his environment, we've got to go out and find 70, 80 foot, 100 foot waves. And that obviously is very hard to do from a practical perspective, but it's also very dangerous. Practicing in environments like that, the risk eventually catches up with you and people get hurt. 
So we had to look back. And so we look back and we start to think about in the ancients, how did they, when they got to a certain level of mastery, improve? And if you look way, way back into the medieval sort of folk, uh, literature on the, in, the, in the Bushido code, the samurai got to a certain point where sword play and sword practice were no longer effective in terms of enhancing their top end game. What they did was they went on these physical and emotional and spiritual challenges they put themselves through to learn more about themselves. And through that process of understanding more about who they are, they started to excel in their craft. So we took that idea recently and we dragged four of our best male athletes and we took them on a kind of a spiritual and emotional uh, pilgrimage through Patagonia with uh, a partnership we have with the US Navy and two uh, uh, master chiefs from uh, Dev Group or SEAL Team 6. And in a combined research program where we're actually looking at pre and post images of their brain amongst a thousand other things, we put them through basically a living hell for 10 days and to see, number one, if that transformation effect would have some personal ex experience for them, and number two, for us to learn and understand from the science. Um, and uh, again, it, we just got back about 10 days ago. It was a staggering experience. But um, any, most of you guys know Matt Poole, the Aussie Ironman, Surf Lifesaver? He was one of our candidates for the trip. He, was, he sort of got himself elected. Voluntold, we call it. And um, his day four of him sort of explaining what he's going through. Matt Poole. You might have to turn that Iron up a Man. little bit, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just absolutely <laughs> speechless, I guess, after the, the last two days. It's, you know, we were up at, we, we, it was great to, or I, was, I guess it was pick, picking up from where we left off, it was sad to see Ian go due to injury. And, um, yeah, you know, we left Andy and the whole crew and headed off at 5 o'clock in the morning, up at 3 o'clock again for day four. But little did we know just how big day four was going to be. We knew we had the rafters packed. We knew we had a whole lot more gear, but I wasn't expecting that. That was, um, that was something else. We, uh, we jumped on the rafters pretty early in the morning, paddled across the river. We crossed gra uh, glaciers. We did the full hog all day, and we basically um, pulled up at about 3.30, 4 o'clock at the bottom of a waterfall here, at the bottom of a, a mountain, and um, yeah, from from there, Rafa was injured, he also did his knee, Eric stayed behind, and, and Jonathan stayed with them, so it was down to m myself, Kai, Pete, and Steve, and um, we set off at 4.30, somewhat 12 hours into the day already of hiking, and, and um, we began on our journey to summit the, uh, monstrous peak and it was it was the most remarkable experience of my life I've never done anything like that before it was hands down without question the most the toughest most challenging experience of my life and to be honest it was the most terrifying at stages as well I've never ever had that sheer fear of terror like I did there it was it was ridiculous so so this is a guy who trains six, eight hours a day. And so how do you push these people who are already so good at what they do? You have to take them out of their environment. You have to challenge them. And the biggest tool we have in that kit is uncertainty. Putting them in places where they're not comfortable, where they're beginners again, where they don't know what's coming. And then you get these sort of comments and these sort of transformational experiences. And when was the last time you hear people talk like this? It doesn't happen very often, you know. But as a training tool for us, it's a powerful reflection, it's a powerful insight into themselves, and also for us, an ability for us to show them what they are and who they are, hold a mirror up to themselves if they like, and then give them a point of reference for what they can stand. So we haven't got the science back yet, so I can't let you know what we actually found, but it's an interesting perspective. Using Pete and Steve, who are the, both the Navy operators, this is an example. If you apply that training over and over and over again, listen to one of their trainees speak about his experience. This is a, this is a prep reel for the Navy, but you'll hear him talk in the way that you saw the insight from Matt. I started doing this triathlons and, and endurance sports, ultra runs, just to test my soul, to see what I'm about, to see in a 150 mile race at mile 75 when I feel really bad, that's when you know 
that's the only time you can find out what the human body is all about, what, what you're made of, to find out limits to myself, limits to the human soul. And every day I'm trying to see if I have limits. I run anywhere from 125, 150 in a week. So I'll try and put in about 450 miles a month. Usually every day I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I run anywhere from 10 to 15 miles in the morning. And then I, I live about 25 miles from work. So I, I get my bicycle, commute into work, do a normal work day at lunchtime around noon. I'll run again anywhere from five to eight miles, whatever it may be, come back, work, and around 5.30, I'll ride back home 25 miles on my bike. If I'm feeling good and I want to get more miles, I'll get off the bike and do like a short three or four or five mile run. That's my everyday life. So I don't just train like an hour or so. I train until something is uncomfortable and then that's when you know who you are. The only easy day was yesterday. It, it just never ends. I mean, I've done some races where you're on a one mile track and you're run for 48 hours straight. So imagine running 48 hours around a one mile track. And it's not like you're sleeping, you're, you're running for 48 hours, how many miles you can get. I wanna talk about mind torture. My life doesn't have a finish line. So when I cross the finish line of the Ironman, it doesn't matter. So you can hear in his comments, this is an individual who trains at that level over and over and over again. He's been put in that environment. And his job requires that level of commitment. So it's not like we compare ourselves to that particular training modality. But it shows you the power of when you put the right environment around an individual, you support them, you train them, you challenge them. And they start to naturally evolve to this point where they start to say, it's, I've I got to look inside a little bit more. I've got to find out what I'm made of. And that's when we start to see real growth in terms of elite performance in our, in our, in our athletes. And as you can probably see, we start off very pragmatically with training and skills and nutrition and the, and the technical side, but you can see more and more our focus shifts down to really understanding what the individual's about and how to challenge them in a way that brings the best out of them. And using, whether it's physical challenge or whether, as you saw on the CERC program, just emotional challenge, without fail, every one of my athletes would prefer to be put through 24 hours of physical torture versus doing that CERC program where they have to expose themselves emotionally on stage. So those tools are powerful and they're very effective in moving people. So ultimately we get to this point where we start to focus heavily on life skills and the simple way to think about that is even for our best athletes, making sure they don't mess up off the field really helps us optimise their performance on the field. And again, Tiger, I'll, I'll call him out. Tiger makes a mistake with his life, everything else falls to hell. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So I use, and you know, I promised I'd use some of this clip, so I'll use Stratos as an example to explain how that applies and what we did. So in case you missed it, <laughs> I'll show a short little clip just to remind you what it was all about. The spirit of man has always been to try to go higher, deeper, faster. I think I'm one of these guys who always wanted to be the first one on a place where no one has ever been before. I always wanted to be on top of something. We're going into the next era in space. If we can prove that you can break the speed of sound and stay alive, I think that's the benefit for future space explorations. If something goes wrong, you're all by yourself. And th that is really scary. This is what I'm thinking about all the time. You know, uh, I've been working four years on this project. Um, I've been waiting 52 years for somebody to beat my record. It's been a long journey, and uh, we're all delighted that we're finally that final step. Current status of the capsule is green, instrumentation is green, and medical is green. Stand by, we're getting ready to hear a trip to space.
celebration. You were born ready, Felix. Move pilot monitor to the exit position. Roll the door open and engage the door stop, Felix. Doors open. Disconnect the oxygen hose. Roger. Add up, boy. Stand up on the exterior step. Release the helmet tie-down strap. Start the cameras. And our guardian angel will take care of you. Sometimes you have to be enough really high. How small you are. I'm going over. <laughs> oh my god! <gasps> he's dead. Oh god, he's flailing like a mother. He did it! Yeah! So obviously an amazing uh, outcome for us. Uh, it's a little hard to read, but uh, to me it's those last couple of seconds that capture it. It's what people got engaged with and how they attached themselves to that experience. And uh, I just use this slide. I'm not in the marketing side of the shop, but to really, the most important two figures here, you see the 2.3 streaming views and then the 8 million streaming views for the final jump. Again, reflecting back on the 2.3 was the day the balloon failed three days before we launched. So again, failure as a... And, and uh, as not necessarily a bad thing, had we launched on that day, we wouldn't have hit those numbers on the second day. So you never know what Faye is going to allow you to share in following down the track. So you've got to keep that in mind. Um, but really for us, as I wrap it up, I, from my perspective, I thought about it. I thought, okay, what's it, why, is people, why did it get so popular? I mean, it was exciting. It was fun. I get it. And the media program was good. And we had brilliant people and a big team really behind the whole thing. But to me, there was something more. What were, why were people so captivated by the idea? And we started to reflect on this a little bit. And this is one perspective we sort of came up with. Was, you're familiar with Joseph Campbell's work, the comparative mythologist, the writer, the lecturer, an, an American guy, who basically went back and looked at all these amazing stories through, since the dawn of time. And he came up with this idea of the hero's journey, where you start with a dream, you set out on your journey to sort of on this dream of challenge this dream if you like and very quickly you move from what we call the known into the unknown. You move into this space where the thing you planned or the future you've imagined is not happening the way you wanted it to happen. And typically there's some challenge, there's a re revelation, you learn more about yourself, you come back around. And when we looked at it, it was exactly the journey that we'd been on with Felix and the team. We started off with an idea, we started off with a plan but ultimately that plan turned itself around. We had a lot of failures. Felix had problems, the program had problems, 
But ultimately, if you there's that one slide there, it's a little hard to see with a plaque, but it says, how do you want to be remembered? And we had those plaques made up because we realised for Felix, as he was trying to learn to overcome what he was going through to, to do this significant event, he had to learn a lot about himself and what he was wanted to reflect upon as he got older. So we said, imagine yourself in 30, 40 years and you're telling this story to your child, or your grandson or your nephew, or whatever it may be. How are you going to explain this period in your life? And at that moment, as he started to recognise it, and we started to recognise it was a significant time, the life skills piece, the awareness of what we're doing in terms of ourselves was more important and we started to build through. And the most wonderful thing for me about the whole thing was Here's a guy who was challenged, had a dream, but came up against his dream and really buckled under pressure at one point there. But then through that growth and, and sort of learning, he ends up becoming an ambassador to the rest of the world on, for youth, for the United Nations, on how to inspire people to achieve their dreams. So it's a really amazing story. And for me, that's one way we try to explain why people are captivated by the program so much. But to wrap it all up, I'm up to my hour. And so maybe there's one thing I can leave you with today. This is the way we think about things. Most people talk in my business about that extra 1%, 2%, half a percent, push, 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 get that little bit extra. For us, it's completely the opposite. We look, about, look at it this way. If you look at us now and you reflect back on early time, a couple hundred thousand years ago, people were running around, apes, early, ape, early hominoid, if you like, rocks, sticks, spears, and if we look at ourselves compared to them at that point in time today, we're pretty good, aren't we? We're doing pretty well. We've evolved, so to speak. Well, the way we look at it is in, what's it going to look like if we turn that model around and look forward? In a couple hundred thousand years, we'll look back on today and go, a bunch of monkeys running around with smartphones. <laughs> Won't we? So for us, that screams to the potential of the, uh, the opportunity for working with people. And to me right now, with the new technologies, the new insights, the ability for the world to learn as a whole and share and, and, and confirm and evaluate and understand using, on a global scale means that the improvements aren't one or two percent. We've got hundreds of percent in front of us. We just need to figure out how to crack that nut. So uh, I'm sure part of you will be part of that program in the next few years. And thank you for your time today.